Hey everybody, welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio today. And we're doing a response to Danny Silk in his book, The Culture of Honor. Yes, it's been out for a minute, but Remnant Radio likes to cover yesterday's news today. So stay tuned, it's gonna be a great episode. <laughs> you are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we wanna to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Come one, come all. We're talking about the culture of honor. It's something, I mean, we certainly don't want a culture of dishonor, right? Uh, we get a, an exciting program for you today as we're kind of diving into some of the contents of culture of honor. We're going to be tackling pretty much chapter two. Uh, there's a lot of chapters in culture of honor. Chapter one, telling a story of someone who fell into sin. Uh, three and four, talking about church discipline. Uh, five, which talks about kind of like prosperity stuff. And then six, uh, also circling back on to the life uh, within church discipline and how that's kind of get lived out. And then six, kind of conclusion, or seven and eight. And I don't know, M my numbering is all off because I'm doing it by memory as we're talking about it. But uh, it's going to be a cool program for you today, kind of give you an, uh, an understanding of what to expect. But before we do that, I want to let you know that Remnant Radio is entirely crowdfunded. So if you've been blessed by this episode or maybe other episodes we've done and you want to support the channel, there are links in the description. You can give a one-time gift on PayPal or a reincurring gift on Patreon. As those five bucks a month you give on Patreon, you get access to extra content. Uh, without further ado, I want to introduce you to the fellas. I got Michael Miller and Michael Roundtree with me. Michael Miller there in the middle. Michael Roundtree on the far right. Uh, Miller, let's start with you today, man. How how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing good. Um yeah, nothing really to say. Excited. Uh, Michael's going to come out here next week with his son, and we're going to go for a hike. Oh, That'd cool. Yeah. yeah. My boy turned My boy turned 13, so he's he's becoming a man. So we're going to go climb a mountain with uh, basement basement boys nice. going to come out and be my Sherpa. So, yeah, I get, uh, I get so six hours. That's it. <laughs> Only six hours to come out of the basement for, for yeah. a hike. We'll, we'll let you out for a little bit, just long yeah, enough to lead us up a mountain, and then we'll put you back in the basement. Which, considering so. I've only been in the basement, is that really a good idea? <laughs> to use me <laughs> as your Sherpa. You're the mountain guy. Oh, my goodness. Uh, <laughs> awesome. So, yeah, I'm excited about that. And, uh, yeah, this show, you mentioned it at the top of the show, uh, Josh, that this this book has been out for a while. When, when we decided to do this, I was like, oh, man. I mean, I highlight all my books. So I had to go back and kind of read through and refresh myself a little bit on the book. And, um you know, we have some important things to talk about. It touches on yeah. uh, church governance, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, big on the fivefold. I remember picking up the book and thinking, oh, this is going to be all about like honor people and be nice to them, like that kind of thing. Very much a small part of the book. Uh, I, I, yeah, it's a very small part of the book. What the book is really about is like honoring the flow of authority from. Uh, really largely based on 1 Corinthians 12, beginning 28, where it says, and God gave first apostles and second prophets and third teachers, and then, I can't remember what's after that, workers of miracles and speakers of tongues and all these other kind of things. So um, majorly based upon like that flow. And um, he interprets this verse to be like a flow of authority and a flow of like, if you want revival in your church, then you have to have apostles at the top. And, and it creates questions for those who interpret, say, 1 Timothy 5 to say, you know, the elders are to direct the affairs of the church and the elders are to lead the church, et cetera. So we, we have some interesting things to talk about today. Yeah, for sure. And I would say that when it comes to uh, culture of honor, the, the way that honor is being defined in the book is just helping, uh, helping individuals come into the fullness of what God has called them to be, right? So the reason the fivefold is brought up even in this book seems to be, we want you to be able to like live out heaven's plan for your life, right? That's what we want for you and for your family. And the best way for us to do that is for you to be free, right? We want you to have a knowledge of, of the law and the gospel and how that works out. We want you to have a knowledge of, of those who are governing the church uh, and how that's to be governed and how it's going to create this healthy culture that's going to carry revival. And over and over in the book, it seems as if the culture of honor is what's sustaining the the flow, the stream, the revival culture, the revival context. So it's, it's really trying to teach people how to um, respect one another's giftings and callings and how to treat each other again, when it comes to church discipline and other things, how to treat one another in order to sustain a, a move of God or revival. And that's that's the premise 
of the book. Uh, there are six areas that we disagree with that we'll bring up here in a second. Uh, I'll just kind of touch on them real quick, but I also want to talk about the things that we liked about this book. And also, um, I want to talk about why we don't think this will be received too well. Um, but we'll get to that in a second. Let's talk six areas that we primarily disagree. Uh, we had concerns about the novelty, right? There's just a lot of new things. They, they claim, hey, church discipline didn't look like this in the Bible. Uh, they'll claim things like, uh, you know, this is the, the new secret sauce. We're going to read some of those quotes. Uh, fivefold are, are not intermediaries. Uh, it's another concern that we have, a disagreement we have. It, it seems as if they suggest you can't come into your fullness. Um, you can't encounter heaven is really the, the phrase that they keep saying over and over in the book, unless the fivefold are there. Now, we'll agree that those gifts are necessary to equip and train, uh, but, but that's a different thing than encountering heaven, experiencing heaven. The gifts are not personalities or offices. That's something that we all believe that is uh, very contradictory in the book. Uh, the book causes divisions and distinctions. If you have these gifts, then, then you have uh, uh, these kinds of divisions, uh, these kinds of weaknesses. If you have these gifts, these are better than those gifts. It creates divisions within the body of Christ. Uh, teachers are demonized over and over and over in the in the book uh, and then there's an uh, unsustainable or there's i'm sorry un uh, unverified claims there are unsubstantiated claims throughout the book things are just stated blatantly as fact and as truth that just there's no corroborating evidence there's no bible verse there's nothing it just stated as fact uh, and we want to walk through some of those things and say man this is is creating unhealthy cultures. And, and maybe I toss it over to Miller for a second. You know, Miller, you've experienced things in a charismatic culture. And, and we're all charismatics. We all speak in tongues. We all prophesy. We all pray for the sick. We all very much believe in those things. We believe in the fivefold. Don't get that on the front end. But you've experienced this book being weaponized against you. So this isn't like a neutral thing for us. This is like a we've experienced the byproducts of that. Do you want to kind of speak into that, your experience and kind of what other charismatic leaders are saying about this book? Yeah, man, I can. I, I didn't expect to just jump right in on that because I, my fear is that anybody who's in or a part of that, uh, part of churches that actually promote this book in a significant way, that they would immediately discount what I have to say because they're going to go, you know, I, I don't want them saying, oh, well, he got hurt. So, of course, he's going to attack this, right? And that's not really my aim. Um I think there's actually some some scriptural issues with some of the things we're seeing. Now, some of the stuff that I think gets weaponized or things that I experienced or I have friends who've experienced uh, in these kind of environments where culture of honor is sort of the playbook for their church ecclesiology and the value system of their church is how honor gets equated to silence. Um, you know, if you want to honor somebody, then you don't talk about things that they've ever done that, that you think are wrong. Um, that honoring them would be uh, staying silent about that. And, and then also um, how honor also looks like, I mean, I, I've, again, I don't think Danny is saying these things or promoting these things, but I'm thinking these are things that are happening or seeing these things happen, is how uh, it creates an environment where you're, um, as a member in the church, your sole job is to support the vision of whoever that apostolic leader is. And that if you'll just honor that leader, then, one day God will honor you and then you will get to be the one who's implementing the, your own vision. Um, and I, I actually disagree with that. Um, I don't think we're called to honor an apostolic leader's vision. I think we're, we're already getting the chance to honor the vision of Jesus, which he already has spelled out in scripture. So mm. those are some of the things I experienced. But, but at the end of the day, I think what's why this is worth doing is because this uh, book is the playbook for many, many, many charismatic churches for their ecclesiological structure and value system. Yeah. And I cannot emphasize enough just how influential this book is across this, the charismatic spectrum. Um, and so I think it's worth addressing, especially as we have so many strong disagreements with it. Um, and, and yet again, there are some things we do like about what he teaches. Like I, I like the fact that they honor the idea of gifts, that they yeah. want to make room for people to use their gifts. I am all for that. Um, so anyway. Yeah, that, uh, Roundtree, kinda... do you have something you want to add in there? Oh, uh, well, man, I just, I wanted to amen you, Miller, when you were talking about like, this is the playbook for so many charismatic churches. And as an ecclesiological structure, as a church governance, this is something not just to run from but to sprint from like do swim moves like get get out is that like really really dangerous uh some of the things that are said in this book now 
Uh, again, we honor, we love fivefold ministry. We believe in apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors. Like we, we're all on board for it and agree with some of the things that are in this book. But there's just some really dangerous stuff uh, in here, and I, and I think we should just start talking, uh, talking through it. And our, and our hope is that uh, people who are part of the charismatic church could start identifying, like, oh my gosh, this is like if 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 your church is constantly talking about honoring the authority of apostles and prophets that you can bring heaven's reality to earth and sustain revival. That is Bethel church language. And I guess, so I, I kind of come out with it and I, <laughs> you know, I'd love to, I, I would totally interview Bill Johnson. I doubt that he would come on the show because for sure I do it. some of his stuff, like I would totally, I would love to, I consider him a brother and I, I think that, you know, he loves the Lord. But we just have Amen. some real concerns. And I think just as leaders, we have to be able to share our concerns and to speak with nuance and say, oh, my gosh, like this thing that you said, oh, that was really dangerous. Uh, that actually bordered on a heresy. It sounds a lot like Marcionism when you said that or it's not you, like I, we need to be able to speak with this kind of nuance. And everybody wants us to say Bethel's not a Christian church. It is a Christian church or else they want us to say, like, you know, embrace everything Bethel. And I'm like. Can I just say, like, there's some things I'm really, really concerned about, but they, they do, you know, love God too. Like, it's it's just, it's a mixed bag. But I'm going to jump in right uh, on this, like, quote we have. Josh, you, you listed our concerns. And the first one was uh, concerns about novelty. And what we mean by this is is kind of like this idea that... Uh, that we've discovered the new way of doing things, and this is the way that will sustain revival. Um, so just listen to this. And th this is actually from like the introduction to the book. It's like a quote from someone else actually about the book, just as you're opening the very first pages and already I'm going, Ugh. but here it is. It says, I'm grateful to Danny Silk, who in Culture of Honor has explained the recipe. And he's actually quoting the book because Danny Silk uses that word too. Uh, the recipe that is the backbone of a 10 year plus revival that is rapidly accelerating into a movement and already impacting the nations of the world. Guys, I, if your church is using the kind of language like we discovered the recipe for revival, like just stay away from that. It's just really dangerous because uh, you, you suddenly start inventing new things and Bethel will get to some of the new things that they've invented. But but the recipe is actually I'll, I'll tell you what the recipe is. It's it's actually this. Like if we'd actually do this, okay, uh -oh. Uh -oh. that would be the recipe. So Acts two forty two. It said it actually tells us Luke's Luke gives us the blueprint for hey you want the miracles and signs and wonders and you want all these things happening in your church you you want like you know if you want to use the language of revival and you know I'm one who believes there's a sovereignty of God in terms of when revival comes but but if you if you want just like a general like you want a powerful and effective church here's what you do it says and they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayers and awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles and all who believed were together and had all things in common and selling their possessions, etc., to provide for the needs. And day by day, attending the temple and breaking bread in their homes with glad and generous hearts, praising favor, favor or praising God and having favor. And the Lord added to their number day by day. Now, the reason I emphasize and is because all of those things, and you want them all, don't you? Don't you want like a crazy generous church that's meeting people's needs, uh, that's like excited to gather together and share meals Amen, together, yeah. and people are getting saved? Well, it looks like here's how you do it. Devote yourselves to the apostles' teaching. The scripture, not this mess that we're reading about. The apostles' teaching in the scripture and to the fellowship, the sharing of life together and the breaking of bread, communion. There's a whole sermon in itself and a prayer. You pray, you pray, you pray. Guys, you want a healthy church? Do those things. And all that revival culture stuff that they're talking about, the Bible already tells us how to do it. And it yeah. doesn't have anything to do with a brand new recipe that was just discovered in the 21st century. Yeah. And I want to talk about how they got there, Michael, because um, I, I think what you're touching on is we want to push against new um, because new doesn't always mean better. We live in a Western context where like the new iPhone, the new, the, you know, the new computer, the new TV, all these, the newer is better. Uh, but this is actually really countercultural to the kind of worldview of the scriptures, the, the authority looking back to what was there, what was the foundation that the things are being built upon is what we're called to in the church. But, but I want to again, commend Bethel for what they're aiming at, right? They have a very countercultural message. Uh, if you think about the, the, pol the political world, 
world of character assassination and and just fighting constantly. You get on YouTube, you find all the heretic hunters who are angry and mean at all Christians who disagree with them. I mean, there's only only three of them are getting into heaven, and each of them have their own YouTube channel. You know, like it's it's just it's this angry, uh, hypercritical spirit culture, and Bethel's trying to push against that. Right? They're trying to push against it. We're trying to honor people, mm-hmm. trying to love people. We're trying to see what God is calling out of them. Uh, this this culture of honor uh, is is also uh, uh, it, it also like in chapter one. He's talking about the root cause of issues that are coming up in the church, going to the root, honoring those individuals, uh, not as expendable, uh, but really looking at the congregation and the people in the congregation as valuable members that we need to empower. So so I want to honor them for all of those issues. But I do think that what they're doing, there's a Bill Johnson quote that I feel like is perfect right here. It is responding yeah. to truth will keep you safe, but uh, 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 reacting to error will only create another error. That's actually Bill Johnson quote. And I think mm. that Bethel is doing that very thing. What they're doing is they're seeing all of the backbiting and the angriness and the political space and even within the church. And what they're doing is they're trying to create a subculture, a counterculture to that that says, this is how we fix it, right? We fix it by, by when when church things happen uh, that, that look like they're, they're off, we're not going to address it publicly. We're going to kind of take care of it in-house quietly because they want to crucify people, but, but, but we're going to really change things up here because we want to honor and love those individuals. And, and what, what's happened is that they're swinging so far in the other way, they're creating a culture that silences people who have dissenting opinions. We're going to talk about teachers who disagree theologically. They're going to silence those voices because if those voices raise up and say, hey, this is what the authority of the scriptures say, they'll be like, well, you don't have that apostolic vision. That's why you can't see this. And and they begin to actually do the opposite of what they want, which is empower the gifts. They actually silence and, and, and quell the gifts. And the only people who have a voice are those apostles and prophets within the community. So, so I want to say, first of all, I think they have good motivation. They're doing great things. But within that, I feel like they're over overcompensating for that very thing. Miller, did you, did you want to hop on there? No, that's exactly what I was hoping you were going to get to, because the the irony here is the very thing they're trying to avoid, which is an overreaction, actually is what they're doing. It's an yeah. overreaction to the cancel culture in the church. Instead, it's an honor culture instead of a cancel culture. And we actually think that there's a scriptural precedent that needs to be brought in between those two things, which has to do with rightly addressing uh, sin and abuse, um, but in a way that actually... Uh, deals with it holistically as well. And I think um, so that some of the examples that we're going to get into that he even uses in the book will demonstrate this, that they actually, they failed to do justice for the church and actually thereby sinned against the church and might have even be guilty of bearing false witness, breaking a Ten Commandment in order to protect those who sinned uh, and restore them. So, so all of these yeah. quotes are coming from chapter two. Michael, you talked about novelty a little bit. Do you want to pick up another one of those quotes in there on novelty and we kind of touch base sure. on that? Sure. Okay, here's here's a, another quote. So some of these traditions that have, uh, that I have come across, unfortunately, I, uh, I and them to be highly unjust. I think we wrote that wrong. Anyway, I view them to be highly unjust and a poor representation of who I have come to know is my Lord. The culture of honor is a contest to those long-held approaches and core values one can easily and in the historic and contemporary uh, one one can let's see and core values one can easily and in the historic. I, Michael, I, don't know, I, I had a PDF that I copied and pasted over and and I had to like <laughs> adjust and edit. You're as making I was me doing. like read this with like, I'm so a sorry. Couple of missing words. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, let, let me read the, I'm getting to the meat of the quote right here. He says, I mean no disrespect in presenting this perspective. It is confronting and reforming what we've come to know about church leadership, authority, and church discipline for literally centuries. So I, I think, you know, the key word there is reforming. And as Protestants, we're, we're all on board for that, Protestant Reformation. And always reforming, that's our motto. But our key is we're reforming back to the way it was in the first century. We're reported, we're reforming back to the original biblical church structure. Uh, now, let me just ask you guys this, because when I read this, I think that's not the way it was in the first century. Like when I read the way their model is, is proposed, it doesn't look like the Bible to me. It looks like a brand new thing. But right. maybe I'm understanding this wrong. Jo- Josh, you're saying it's right. Josh, why... Why do you believe that 
the model that they're proposing is not actually an back like a reforming to the old, but reforming into something brand new and unseen before. I mean, it's actually here in this very next quote that he has here, right? Uh, the steps in this recipe uh, combine the ingredients in such a way that creates something powerful uh, in an environment that is uncommon on the earth today. It is an environment that attracts and hosts the presence of God. He's saying this is this is not going on. We're we're introducing something new and something powerful and something different. And and when I when I look at this again, I I want to say that the heart of this is good. Because if what you're seeing is no power, no manifestations of the spirit, and you're aiming for power and manifestations of the spirit, that's a good aim, right? So, so, so go for it, Bill, go for it, Danny, go for Bethel, who are trying to push into supernatural things. But when those supernatural things have you redefining church leadership, what authority looks like, and church discipline, those are the foundations of the Protestant Reformation. That's not... That's not moving. That's like retroactive. That's that's, that's being regressive, not progressive, right? Um, we we don't need to be inventors of new doctrine. First Corinthians tells us explicitly. I believe it's in it's in four six or six four. My dyslexia. I can't remember the, the numbers, but uh, uh, it says not to go beyond what is written. And First Corinthians uh, chapter fourteen. It's like those who are spiritual realize the words I'm writing are the words of God. The the scriptures, the holy scriptures, not to go beyond what is written. They are inspired. They are revelatory and they are the foundation in which we build church doctrine, church discipline, church practice off of, not the newest program, the newest strategy, the newest way to, that can, like, according to sociology, help us feel like our, our, our felt needs are being met. But the Bible, the Bible is the foundation. So if this uh, confession is going to make someone look bad, um, but it t causes us to uh, disobey scripture and we have to choose between, well, I don't want to make them look bad and uh, uh, I don't want to disobey scripture. But if I have to decide on one of them, I'm going to make sure that I don't make them look bad. You have violated holy scripture. Your model needs to be cast to the wind. And I, and I think that there are areas yeah. in this book that does that. So, yeah. And Mil Miller, because yeah. I want to just follow up on that because I want to make sure we're representing Danny uh, rightly. Um, because the, the direct quote is, it is confronting and reforming what we've come to know about church leadership, authority, and church discipline for literally centuries. So we're uncomfortable with the, the feeling of novelty in that. But could it be that what he means by that is like, hey, I'm only reforming what we've come to know about it, not the way it was in the first century. Like, like could it be that he's saying we've got it wrong throughout church history, especially in the last few hundred years? But let's go back to the beginning. Miller, do you think that he could be saying that? Yeah, I actually think he is saying that. I, I don't think he's trying to create something new. I think he thinks he's stumbled onto what it was. But the problem is he, he hasn't, and he doesn't provide any evidence for that. But then on top of that, it's the recipe issue that really needs to be addressed. Because what he's saying is that we found out the recipe. And what is this recipe for well, it's for sustain. Well, it's for manufacturing revival and sustaining revival, which are two things I think are actually sovereign things. They're not up to us to create or uh, uh, sustain. But then behind it all is the fact that he's claiming that they've done that, and so what he's saying is we actually have revival at Bethel, and we're sustaining revival at Bethel, and then um, which this underlies a problem is because when you think that you've found or you've been able to manufacture and sustain, uh, you can easily fall victim to pragmatism, which says if it works, the means be damned. At the end of the day, he thinks he's found what works. And I, I think this is the the issue that we found in a lot of different areas. But but also there's a level of arrogance and in, 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 that concerns me here. Um, to me, it resembles nothing different than what happened at the fall and what happened at the Tower of Babel. It's this, we're going to get to what we want, and we found out a way to bypass the biblical means to get there. So God, you know, you think of Genesis and God giving mankind a mandate, and yet they found this shortcut to be like God, and they chose it. Uh, same thing with the Tower of Babel, right? They're supposed to spread over the nations, of, like are supposed to spread out and, and multiply and fill the earth. Instead, they gather to one place, and they build a tower to access the gods, Another way to bypass what God has, has ordained uh, to get what they're after. And I, I think that's what we're finding here is he thinks that they've literally found the recipe to manufacture and sustain revival. 
and he's quite uh, adamant and confident and about that without really proving it um, biblically it, or without proving it uh, statistically. Miller might be correct in saying that um, he doesn't think that this is new. I, I might be completely wrong in this assessment, um, but what I will tell you is that the approach to church discipline is new. Um, yes. uh, it, it is, it is foreign to the scriptures. It is not, and maybe it's new as in we're not addressing church tell, discipline. Tell us about it's it. It's not, it's not that new. I mean, but, there was a, because a, it's basically like we honor people by doing church discipline all hundred percent privately under the table yeah. behind closed doors. Right. Well, you I mean, that's not always, that's not always the case. Not like necessarily. In chapter one, not necessarily. Yeah. In chapter one, he I, has, I do. Go ahead. I do remember J I do remember Bill publicly rebuking Jason Westerfield, the uh, yep. the guy who was like a power Good evangelist turned New Age. Which praise God, thank you, Bill. Okay, but what were you? Yeah. What was the story? Well, I was going to say, like in chapter one, he he has them. What do you think would would restore you to this community? And he has the person express their own repentance. Which actually, in chapter one, the way he handled the discipline and the correction and to investigate if there was true repentance, I think it was actually done pretty well. Like I, oh, I, was great. I actually, it really I was, it, I love it was that really chef, edifying. That part I was like, it. yeah, huh? Like I definitely am going to do this moving forward. Like this was a really clever and healthy way of approaching this. I was like, that's good. Um, uh, the problem was like in, in, in a later chapter, it talks about a, a worship leader who committed adultery on his wife. And then the church calls him and to kind of follow up and be like, hey, you coached him, you talked to him. We want to tell the church publicly. And he advises them not to do that. And it's like, man, you you have a guy who's in leadership. And one of the requirements for an elder is that they be above reproach. Like there's something about their standing with the community that's extremely important. And 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 then, you know, I'll I'll go to First Thessalonians or First Timothy 520, which talks about rebuking publicly so others stand in fear. Some might go, well, that's for those who are, you know, continuing in unrepentance. Uh, I would I would say that, that there's something really important about that passage, though, that really undermines the whole argumentation of the book is, is Danny makes the case that we're not going to confront people's sin publicly because Jesus has already received their punishment and it would only harm the individual if we cause this to go public. Whereas the Bible says that you're actually supposed to go public with this in order that others stand in fear. Danny's focus is only on the one individual and not necessarily the whole. Now, maybe right. you'll say First Thessalonians or First Timothy five twenty is not a good verse for that. But I think the, the 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 church history practice in general is to say when you've broken confidence, you're no longer above reproach. There needs to be a kind of public. Well, this guy needs to step down, and this is why. Um, you guys want to jump in on that? I heard Miller well, jump in the bit. Yeah, with, I've heard Bill say this, that that fear is the opposite. It's the counter faith. It's faith in the wrong direction. But um, he's failing to to actually take give credit to the place of fear that God actually employs, which is the quote you just mentioned. You know, like it's supposed to cause the body to be afraid so that they don't fall into the same sin. Or Job 33, 14, when God gives dreams that actually terrify people to keep them away from sin. So there is a sense in which God employs fear in a healthy way. And I, I think what they've done is they've demonized the word fear to where fear can only be demonic and bad. Uh, and, and the idea of a healthy sense of fear is completely removed. Um, now that's a Bill quote. That's not something I'm reading in Culture of Honor, though. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think for me, the, the deal with the worship leader and not telling the church, like, I get it. Like, usually, like, if somebody sins against me and it's just somebody, like, I don't think everybody's sin needs to be this public thing. I don't think that, like, if someone just... Uh, you know that everybody starts needs to start wearing like a scarlet a uh everywhere they go every time they sin you know like i i don't uh i don't think that however when you are entrusted with the shepherding of god's people like that's a special sin when you violate that trust by sleeping with i suppose a member of the congregation but anyone who's not your spouse that is such a gross violation of trust to not tell the people is, is like a repetition of the sin in a way. Because, you know, Paul will say in Ephesians 4, don't steal from one another because you're members of one another. So, like, we're, we're not just one with Jesus, but because we are one with Jesus, we are one with his body. And for someone to egregiously sin, like horrifically and egregiously sin against the body, somebody in a leadership role 
And to sweep it under the carpet in the name of honor does not promote love. That's actually the opposite of love. Even if they're repentant, the congregation needs to know. And I'm, this is just Michael's thing, and I, I can't necessarily point to a Bible verse for it because, you know, God is a God of grace and people can repent and be restored and that kind of deal. But I'm just saying, like, if you violate your marriage vows and you're a pastor, in my opinion, you should never get a stage and you should never be a pastor again. I will not hire you. I'll the, tell you the, that much. The scripture says you have to be above reproach, and that does bring a reproach. There's no question. So at least there is a stepping down without question. Well, um, but uh, let me let me kind of ahead, jump. Sorry. I want, I want John Davidson's yeah. comment to be seen here. The culture of honor, or, or, I'm sorry, the culture of honor, uh, uh, culture typically only honors those who have influence within the community. And this is really important because the, the topic that we're talking about right now is it protects that person's individual. Who, who are we protecting? We're protecting leaders from the congregants, but it's not protecting the congregants. It's not protecting the sheep. It's protecting the shepherds. And we can't create a system that silences dissent, right? Um, this is a, this is a, again, a, a thing we go back and watch the church called Tove. Th- these are, again, when it comes to the novel stuff, I, I don't think this is the most egregious thing that was taking place in these, these chapters in this book. Uh, I really think what it comes down to is fivefold jargon that, that either, it's possible is being weaponized in a way that Danny Silk doesn't intend. Uh, but when I've read these quotes and I've seen these quotes be weaponized, it actually, it actually tells everyone in the body, you better be a prophet or you better be an apostle or your gift is not going to be respected or honored in this community. Um, and, and that creates tons of abuse and damage. Miller, we, we again, need to, yeah, we just, we need to get into it because we're, okay. we're still dancing around the major egregious stuff. Um, but I think the, the big thing here is, is what we're talking about when, with the gifts of teaching, when we get into that. Okay. So let's, let's go on. You, I'll let so, you guide the conversation here though. Okay. So are the fivefold gifts Miller, intermediary gifts? Uh, oh, go ahead. Okay. Well, I was going to, I wanted to say something I think will maybe be a good hinge point for what you're saying, because Miller, you were talking a lot about the demonizing of the teachers. And to me, that was uh, the most egregious part of the book was, um, was the demonizing of the office of teacher. And, and we can talk about that, but, but here's, here's why it's why one reason why it's such a rub, because you're talking about the new, like the recipe for revival. Here is the recipe for revival. That's great rhetoric. Need, right. But we don't need to, but the teachers, he calls them uh, like, they're like C level, like you got A, B, C kind of ranking. They're just C level. They're obsessed with their theology and not bringing heaven down to earth, like those kinds of things. And so here's the we're, deal. We're going to get like there. How, we got quotations for I, all of this. Uh, I know we are. But like, here's the deal. How are you going to provide me with the recipe for revival if people who interpret the word of God are not valuable to you? Because the way we have the recipe for revival is we read the word of God. And I think that's the core issue. That's Which, not it how you get the back recipe for novelty. revival. Because it if does. it's like, hey, we, we here's the recipe for revival, but also the people who are teaching the Bible – they're not as important and they're not going to be able to give you that. Problem. You need the apostles. They're, they're the, the problem. problem. That's right. Do y'all want to just start with the teachers are demonized? Cause it, y'all keep moving back to that. I feel like maybe <laughs> it pricked a spot in your heart. Maybe, I don't know. Well, I think, um, I think I, I firsthand experienced some of the abuse oh, me too. Uh, of this book being weaponized against me. And I know you guys did too. And several friends of ours as well. Um, but I, I don't want to skip too far ahead. I think we need to just go through the fivefold uh, as intermediaries and then just pull out those quotes and go one by one. And hopefully we can get to get through it fast. OK, so talking about intermediaries. OK, uh, the first quote. Sorry, I still have the camera on on Miller. Uh, uh, throughout the book, we will explore some of the names uh, and have uh, enabled us to establish the very specific kind of relationship in the Bethel community. These are the relationships that attract and sustain the outpouring of God's presence and power in our midst. The name apostle, prophet, teacher, pastor and evangelist and their distinctive anointings, mindsets, and gifts create a network of relationships designed to bring the focus and priorities of heaven to earth. And again, you're going to see heaven to earth language throughout this book over and over and over again. And oh. again, the, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible does not say the fivefold bring heaven to earth. The Bible says that the apostle, prophet, Never evangelist, was. pastor, and teacher are for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. 
That's it. That's what it says. Yep. It doesn't say they're bringing heavenly portal. And I, I know I'm putting words in their mouth now, but it doesn't say that there's like this spiritual like mojo juice that comes seeping out of the apostles veins and into the apostle, the prophets and, and teachers and, and just trickles downhill. And then the congregants can get heaven on earth. What that does is it creates an intermediary system where it's like, if you want to get to heaven, you've got to go through the fivefold ministry, uh, which is, again, a popish, a Romish sort of system that says the way you get to God is through the priesthood. Um, anybody want to comment it's, it's, on that or just oh, another question? Gosh. Yes. No, I, I want to say something about this because the rhetoric is also so my, my major in college was communication and rhetoric. And so what I'm seeing here is a rhetoric that's also uh I hate to say this, but I don't know another term for it. It's going to promote a narcissistic system, a system that says, well, we've got this here. And if you really want to be what God intends for the earth, then you have to employ this system here. And so here's the thing. If you ever leave that system, then no matter what, by its very nature, people are going to look at it and go, you're the problem for leaving because we have what allows us to access heaven. And then the pragmatism part says, and it works, right? They really are seeing miracles. They really are seeing healings. And so then they can also go, yeah, but look at all of the fruit. We're seeing people come to the faith. We're seeing the miraculous. So therefore what we're doing, it works. Um, but forget yeah. the means. I'm going to read the next quote. Genius. Yeah, I'm going to read the next quote. Uh, I believe that one of the primary factors that has kept Bethel Church in a state of preparation for and stewardship of the outpouring of the Spirit is the wineskin of its leadership, mm -hmm. which has been established with an apostolic and prophetic foundation with an expression of each of the other fivefold ministry graces described in Ephesians 4.11. He starts to list. I believe this is true because I'm a member of this team, have seen firsthand how these diverse anointings each address an essential part of the identity and purpose of the church through their specific areas of focus and motivation. Without a complete mature expression of these graces that equip the saints, the people of God cannot be adequately prepared to contain what God is pouring out and release it to the world around them. Okay, nothing in Ephesians 4 talks about an That's outpouring right. of the spirit resulting from the uh from the fivefold office <laughs> we're all in favor of the fivefold office but yep. uh, or fivefold ministries but the outcome of it is that the body is equipped and trained for works of ministry to build itself up in love uh that's number one number two you talk about your lead your ministry structure is a new wineskin of leadership that's a problem because the metaphor of wineskin from scripture speaks of us going from the old covenant to the new covenant so my question is are you really going to apply that to your ministry model at bethel like you went old covenant to new covenant and then bethel and bethel was the next stage i don't think that's what you're trying to say but it increases the the it, it kind of it gives off the impression of novelty once again like we discovered the big new thing that god is doing you definitely are saying that you could you call it a wineskin uh the next thing that's a problem is you talk about this being established with the apost uh, the apostolic and prophetic foundation so uh so once you've you've prioritized the apostles and the prophets and then the other three gifts uh, and and I know this also from the rest of what the book says, like it's definitely apostles are the most important and then it's prophets are the second most important, then it's teachers the third most important. That's a wrong interpretation of 1 Corinthians 12, 28. Every scholar I know considers that a wrong interpretation, but you don't value teachers. That's why you don't know that. You just came to the conclusion that apostles and prophets, well, they're they are the highest priority to God. And like the rest, I guess they're like chopped liver. That's how it reads when you, when you talk about this, but when you specifically talk about the apostolic and prophetic uh, foundation, that's Ephesians 2.20. Uh, that's an allusion to Ephesians 2.20, where God gives the apostles and prophets as the foundation of the, uh, as a foundation of the church with Christ, the chief cornerstone. And, um, and, and so here's the problem with that. If you keep on reading into Ephesians 3.5, uh, what you see is that what's significant about the apostles and prophets is that they received the revelation of Gentile inclusion into the body of Christ. They received the revelation about this new temple that's being built. That's not just like a Jewish thing. It's a, it's a Jew Gentile thing. Paul will call it the new man. So this was a, a mystery that had been hidden for generations, but now revealed to the apostles and prophets. So what is it that makes apostles and prophets foundational? 
According to Paul, it is the revelation they received about Jewish and Gentile inclusion. But according to Danny Silk and Bethel, what makes them foundational is they're just more important than the other guys. And I just, I, I think that's a really dangerous position. Yeah. Well, uh, I, uh, go ahead, Miller. Well, I, I'm curious to know what you guys would say, though, to his quotation out of 1 Corinthians 12, 28, where he says, God has appointed first apostles, then prophets, then teachers, then miracle workers. Uh, and he goes on a list, a bunch of other gifts. Danny is saying that's hierarchical, right? Like that, that these are offices that are appointed by God to run a local parish. Um, do you think that that's what Paul was intending to say when he lists off those gifts and, and says first apostles, yeah. second prophets? What do you think? What do you think? He, the, well, Paul here's, here's how there? we know it. Here's how we know it can't be hierarchical. Um, it can't be hierarchical because he puts prophets above teachers. But in 1 Timothy 5, he says that the elders are the ones who are to direct the affairs of the church. And he goes on to talk about those who receive double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. And this gets to the real meat of like what I especially have trouble with with this book, besides the demonizing of teachers. It is when you put prophets above teachers in terms of authority, if you're going to say 1 Corinthians 12, 28 is about first apostles in authority, then prophets in authority, then teachers in authority, is it goes against the pastoral epistles and what Paul sets out for how a church is supposed to be run. A church is to be, the, the, the affairs of the church, 1 Timothy 5, 17, are to be directed by the elders of the church. And so they're the ones with the hierarchical authority. Uh, and if you have some prophet that rises up, like, let's look at, okay, say my church. Let's say somebody in a, a prophet in my church says, hey, Michael, the Holy Spirit told me that Bridgeway Church has to start a homeless ministry on I-35 by November or else the anointing of the Spirit won't flow through you. Do I have to listen to that? Because I'm, I'm just a lowly teacher and they're a prophet. Um, if if you hold to their hierarchical structure, then then yes, you do have to hold to that. Maybe they would say, well, no, I, I, I don't know what they would say. But the way the book reads is that you would have to hold to that because prophets are first. Yeah, let, let's well, let's. So, look at this so we said what it didn't mean. You said what it didn't mean, right? You said okay. that it's, it doesn't yeah. mean this. What does it mean? Sure. I, th I think, and, and there are some various uh, interpretations of this. In fact, Josh, I know you wrote a note about this, so you want to read that? I know you wrote down uh, three reasons. I mean, I can go into them if you want. Three, Yeah, three potential reasons. It's not to say that three this is potential what it reasons. Is. It, it is what it means, but it's, it's certainly not that, right? Um, the whole point of 1 Corinthians is you think that you're better than this person, and that this, this person is the boss because they're more spiritual because they have this gift. His point is that's not how this works. So if this list is supposed to be hierarchical, it undermines the whole point of the text. What it could mean, potentially, is it could mean that these gifts in their order in which they were given, the apostles were gathered first, uh, the outpouring of the Spirit happens in Acts chapter 2, sons and daughters will prophesy is the sign, and the subsequent act is that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So is it possible this is an order by which the gifts are given? Potentially. Is it an order by which things are established in local communities? Apostles come in. They raise up teachings and in the same way that in Acts, the very first gift that accompanied uh, this new covenant is the gift of prophecy. And now prophecy is being exercised in the local community. And then the apostle raises up teachers and then goes to the next location. That's possibly the way that this is interpreted. And this could also be a way of edification. What gifts edify the body of Christ the most? Well, apostles would be saving souls out of hell. That would be a big edifying work, going into unreached groups, planting churches, seeing souls get saved, that would be the most edifying, I would imagine. And then soon following, right, in 1 Corinthians 14, he says, uh, the, the greatest gift is prophecy. So again, that would place prophecy in a, in a high place within the body of Christ. And then teaching, again, within that same thing. Is it possible he's talking about the way that these gifts are edifying the community? Uh, Certainly, it's possible that is his approach. But what it doesn't mean is the apostles are in charge because they're listed first. In fact, the whole book of Second Corinthians is when Paul is engaging a group of people who are calling themselves apostles. And he's saying, no, you're not in charge because you think you're spiritual and you have these gifts. In fact, uh, uh, the reason that you know, by the way, this is something that's completely vacant from the book. 
the apostles focus on teaching. Nowhere is this mentioned in the book. He talks about signs and marks of an apostle. Nowhere is teaching uh, the doctrines of the faith mentioned, which is explicitly mentioned in scripture over and over again. Uh, planting churches is not mentioned in in that that text at all either. When he talks about listing uh, where the, the gifts and distinctives of an apostle are. So teaching and planting churches, one of the two primary functions of an apostle aren't mentioned there at all. But then Paul goes on to explain his theology of weakness. I suffered. I was beaten. I didn't take any of your money. Like Paul goes on on and on and on to talk about how he's an apostle. And you know he's an apostle, not because of his bringing heaven to earth, right? Like the super apostles are claiming. He's saying, you know I'm an apostle because I I planted you, I cared for you, and I suffered. Like, it, it, it literally, the, the way that this passage is being read, and, and maybe we jump into the divisions and distinctions, because I think that's what this is doing. Um, in, in 4a, in the notes here, um, he, he talks about, this passage in First Corinthians twelve twenty eight. Uh, now, uh, now you are Christ's body and individual members of it. And God appointed in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles. And then he kind of explains what this is. Paul clearly lays out uh, an order of priority in this passage. And in uh, this order, it uh, it's related to the realm of the supernatural that corresponds to each particular office. So not only is he saying that one is more important than the other, but he's he's ascending and the most important, most spiritual gifts, most supernatural, and descending into less supernatural gifts, which again is the exact opposite reason for why Paul is writing 1 Corinthians. People are saying they're more spiritual because they speak in tongues. And he's saying, nope, that's not how that works. Um, by the way, that's... Uh, that's and, uh, <laughs> and all the gifts of the Spirit are supernatural. The gift of teaching is supernatural. Yes, it's supernatural. The, the gift of oh, encourage, yeah. encouragement, the gift of leadership. There is an anointing of the Spirit. Manifestations right? of the Spirit. For these things. Yes, 1 Corinthians 12. These are manifestations of the Spirit. So to suggest that apostles and prophets are all about bringing heaven to earth, but the teachers, they're just focused on what happened in history and the evangelists, they just care about lost people. I mean, yes, evangelists care about lost people. Yes, teachers care about what the Bible says for sure. But this is like the commission of bringing heaven to earth. This is like, this goes back to Genesis 1. Genesis chapter 1, it was to, to subdue the earth. It was to make the entire earth, what started with Eden, to essentially spread the borders of Eden to the end of the earth and make the whole thing look like God was in charge. Adam and Eve failed in it. Satan comes in, becomes the ruler of this age. Then Jesus comes in and conquers the rulers and the authorities and the powers of darkness, rises again, ascends, becomes king, and then commissions us, just as Adam and Eve were commissioned to be fruitful and multiply, commissions us to go and make disciples, and then once again fill the earth and make the whole thing look like God is in charge. Jesus teaches not just apostles and prophets. He teaches all of us to pray our father is in heaven hallowed be your uh, your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven like everybody's supposed to be trying to bring heaven to earth everybody's trying to make this is supposed to be trying to make this this world look more like god is in charge but the book makes it seem like apostles and prophets are especially concerned about this like apostles they just love like he says they love worship music like more than other people because they're so concerned about heavenly things Bro, even go so, so far as just even go so far as to say like apostles don't like they're not about the needs of the people. Oh, gosh, we should get that direct quote because I don't want to misrepresent hey, him. Let, I, I want to read because yeah. this works perfectly. 4C. Someone read 4C for sure. us. 4C. Miller, you want to take it? Yeah, sure. So the problem is that these are earthly focused models of leadership without the flow of grace from the apostles and prophets who are not only focused on seeing what is going on in heaven, but also on releasing that reality here on earth. These models will inevitably lead us to focus on what we know God has done in the past and miss out on what he's doing now. They lead us to care more about knowledge and ex more about knowledge than experience. Bro. This uh, yeah. this quotation it makes literally angry, says honestly. the pastor and teacher wants you to know the truth, but the apostle and prophet wants you to experience the truth. And he's saying that experience is more important than knowledge. This is literally the reason that the charismatic movement is in the dumpster fire that it is in today is because these people are having experiences in the third heaven and they're seeing angels and they're making new doctrines and they're coming down here to tell us that Michael's wearing, you know, wrestling tights and you can believe him because him and Bob Jones both saw the same wrestling tights on Michael. It's like these experiences don't create doctrines for the church. If we're going to be charismatics, we have to be balanced charismatics who don't view truth and experience as if they're contradictory. 
The Apostle Paul wanted people to know the truth because he believed the truth would set them free. Like that's a biblical idea. I'm, I'm getting worked up. Michael Roundtree, yeah. pull me back, dude. Somebody, somebody needs to hold me down. I'm getting <laughs> too excited, right. guys. Well, and, but the other thing is that like he uses this language of flow without the flow of grace from the apostles and prophets. And Miller, you kind of experienced that, didn't you? It was kind of like some, the way it played out for you was submit to the vision of the CEO. Uh, uh, sorry, not the CEO, the apostle. And if you submit to the vision of the CEO apostle, then you'll receive blessing and the, if you don't then you won't like that kind of deal it's it's well not exactly the language that was used is very similar it was always uh this is good soil and if you would be like a seed and you would die in this soil you know give yourself over to the vision of this house which was created by that apostolic leader who got that vision from heaven to bring it to earth uh, if you'll die in the soil uh, of his vision and and uh then one day god will raise you up and bear fruit in you so basically what oh. you're being told is again this is my words now not that person's words my words now are basically be a cog in the system and if you'll be a cog in my system then one day you'll have a system of your own for other people to be a cog in uh, now he would never use those words but that's uh, literally what happens and so people end up having to, to, to set their own lives aside to die in that soil. And then um, when, when things don't eventually pan out, they're like, oh, well, you just never really gave yourself over to the vision. There's always sort of that, that uh, statement made. Oh, you really just didn't die. If you would just die in this vision, I mean, that, that really is it. And so so many people walk away very disillusioned because they're there. They've given up so much of their lives. They've given up all of their money. Uh, to die in that soil and then walk away with nothing to show for it. And then they're blamed when they leave because they never really did whatever they were supposed to do. But the, the problem, biblically speaking, is there's no such thing as dying in some church leader's vision uh, or submitting to some person's vision. Jesus Christ already has a vision for the church. You creating your own is the novelty. And this yeah. idea that you're going to get some sort of extra biblical vision for your church from heaven is the problem because you're saying that you've right. figured it out and you know it better than Jesus did when he spelled it out clearly in the scriptures. That's, that's very yeah. problematic. Well, and Miller, like you, you're not saying that like if a, if a pastor uh, or eldership feels like we really need to emphasize, like I really feel like the spirit is, wanting us to emphasize our Sunday schools over the you know, classes over the next year or something like that. And he calls this like vision night and vision talk and like, Hey, we're really going to do this. And this feeds into community and this biblical priority community. Would you be against that? Or is it more like I have the new recipe? And if you follow my new recipe that doesn't actually do all the things in the Bible, it's just my new recipe, my new wine skin, and, and you need to come over to this side, you need to do what you need to do this, you need to, you know, put your seed in the soil and die here. And, you know, don't worry about the fact that it doesn't fulfill these other biblical mandates. But my vision, which excludes part of the Bible, you need to come over and do this. Is that really what you're taking issue with? Or are you actually taking issue with both? Yeah. Well, so let's let's take my church and well, one, just so you know, yes, the word new wineskin was used constantly. Uh, you know, like, hey, I feel like God has given me a new wineskin, a new kind of church, a new kind of community. And like those kind of words were used a lot. But let's to, to elaborate what I what I mean by this. Um, I'm I'm at a church in suburbia, Denver. Now, um, at my church, the way we practice our faith and how we carry out the ministry of the church is going to look obviously very different than how a friend of mine's church that meets in the inner city of Denver is going to look like, well, one, the inner city church is probably not going to have the kind of finances that a church in a nicer part of suburbia Denver is going to have. So what we're capable of doing is actually going to look very differently. And so I'm totally fine with us meeting a particular people group uh, based upon the needs of that people group. But when you say that you've got this new wineskin that's going to release heaven over a, a region, and that's usually what it is. It's not just like, you know, the people around here and our neighbor neighbors. It's this is going to release heaven in this region, and the whole region is going to take note of our church. Um, that That's a problem. And that's where I think it is a narcissistic system. It's the magic sauce of uh, of that system. 
Yeah, yeah. And we didn't be... even touch. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Josh. Well, I just want to say, I want to be very clear. When people are watching the program, people are like, hey, you should have Danny on. He's been invited. I'd love to have him on. I'd love to address some of these things. But it, but there is this quote that, again, I don't think that this will be received well um, because of things like this. Responding, I'm sorry, uh, before I go too far in this section about teachers, I need to confess that this will not satisfy the needs of teachers reading it. For most teachers, this section would have to be a book in itself because teachers need lots of information before they can uh, conclude uh, uh, uh uh, yeah, conclude most any most anything. I respect that about teachers. I am going uh, to try very hard to convince teachers that I am uh, I am right, or that I am not going to try very hard to convince them that I am right and they are wrong. I am simply going to present why I think uh, 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 we've made a big mistake in making the teacher the highest uh, anoint, uh, anointing operating in the leadership of the American church. Now he goes on to say, um, we haven't gotten to this, and we probably won't today because we only have two minutes left. But he goes on in this to say that teachers are modern day lawyers, scribes, and Pharisees. He says that, uh, he Ew. says that if you don't have, uh, apostolic giftings, uh, uh, pr uh present, he says, but effectively divorcing, he's saying, if you have uh, uh, pastors and teachers leading, you're effectively divorcing supernatural from ministry in any way uh, that has dramatically impacted, uh, impacted the general understanding, uh, of the true role of each anointing. Like he goes on and on to say that like teachers are, they are, going to be opinionated unless they submit to an apostle they're not going to understand this um they're divisive uh and unless they submit to an apostle they're just going to argue about data and our job is not to argue about data but to show people what heaven is like and to teach them what heaven is so over and over again he's built within this book a system of theology that says this is right and if anyone argues with me they're a teacher and if they're a teacher then they 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 they've, they've uh they're just gonna be arguing data and they're, they're not gonna be heavenly minded yeah hold on and did you get to the point about the c grade scale i didn't i don't think i heard that Oh, we it's haven't got circular. there yet. <laughs> well, yeah, because you started to quote it, but you didn't finish it. But it, uh, speaking of teaching, it is a C in a grade scale, and it is what keeps the church only average in its effects and influence. Our need and opportunity to upgrade the anointing to an, to an A is growing. Now, listen, I, I'll be the first to admit that a church that has, you know, I'm cap talking capital C church across the world. Like if we have only teachers and there are no apostles, that's a weakness. I, and I believe in modern apostles. I believe Ephesians 4, 11 to 13 can be used to display that apostles continue into the modern mm. day um, with that. So, yes, it is a gift from Jesus and, and, and we need it. But you don't need to demonize teachers in order to say we need apostles and to describe them Agreed. as a C being on a C grade scale. That's not how God describes them. And the the teachers, and I just can't say this enough, but like the the teachers in the church are the elders. And and like in fact, even in Ephesians 4:11, where it says, and God gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors, teachers, or pastor teachers, like it it seems to group them together. So it's probably something more like a fourfold. And that pastor teacher is actually what we see in the pastoral epistles as the responsibility of somebody who is overseeing a church, like the oversight and the instruction of the church is entrusted to the elders who are the pastor teachers in the church. I'm not saying anyway. So my point being that like you, you're demonizing God's ordained leadership of the church in order to promote apostles, which I'm glad you're promoting apostles. That's great. But you don't need to demonize these other guys. The, the problem here is the way that he's defining all of these terms. Um, so he doesn't realize that the word, I mean, and I'm not, based on what I've read here, he doesn't realize that the word pastor and elder are synonymous. Secondly, he doesn't realize that a pastor is a teacher, um, that they have to be in order to oversee the flock because they have to be able to pass down the doctrines of the faith but then um oh gosh there's something else the the other thing that's uh, that's missing this is the way he defines the terms he's defining the word apostle not how you and i would define it right we we look at apostles as those who are planting churches we think of missionaries um or those who have trans local authority to plant churches they're overseeing the implementation of appointing new eldership and new churches um, he doesn't define it that way. He's basically saying an apostle, and, and this is again, 
this was a personal thing for me. I, I was told that, that I couldn't be the leader of my church because I wasn't apostolic. Mm -hmm. What they mean by that is I didn't have a, a entrepreneurial CEO type gift set that I was really just a teacher. And that's the way it was stated. You're a teacher and that's seen as a lower grade C level gifting. So the definitions are part of the problem here as he defines each of these fivefold, which the quotes we have, which we haven't gotten to show. I, I don't necessarily think personally that the pastor teacher elder are synonymous. I think all elders are pastors teachers. Um, but I don't uh, always say right, I, I agree right. with that. I, yes, we I agree. believe. I agree with that. Okay, cool. We're all on the same page. I, think, I do yeah, we're all on the same page. page. Yeah. I, I think that uh, they're brand new believers who come to faith that have a, a tremendous prophetic gift. Um, the, from the moment that they come to salvation, they can just see and hear. I mean, I've, I've met these people. I know these people personally. I, I've seen them come to faith and just witness these. Man, I just felt like God told me X, Y, and Z, and it was really sharp and it was really profound and it was, wow, that was really what God was saying and revealing and those kinds of things. Um, but I'm not throwing that person into eldership. And I think the same can be true of all of the, the charismata are access to all people, uh, all genders, uh, all, all ages, right? But eldership has qualifications attached to it uh, that are very specific uh, in, in all the ways that the gifts are not. So um, I, I want to be careful in saying I want an elder team. I, I want a group of people who are qualified by by what's given in Timothy and in First Timothy, uh, uh, sorry, First Timothy and, and in Titus. Those passages that talk about elders. I want those kinds of qualifications, and I want those people to be gifted in prophecy. I want some of them to be gifted in teaching, and, and others to be supernaturally graced in evangelism, and some to plant churches. Like I, I really believe that an elder team could, and I'll even go as far to say probably should have a oh, variety of, of of charismatic gifts expressed with. Within the community, um, I'd want to see that, but I also don't want to pretend that someone's again. We're going to get into personalities. We've done stuff on this before. Um, it, it's it's we're conflating too much all at the same time. And and again, I like Danny. I'll go as far to say as I love Danny. I, there's things in this book that I gleaned from that I was like, this is good, and I want to implement some of this. And other parts of it, I was like, Danny, why are you just saying this as if it's fact, not just. In my experience, this is what we've done, and we found this to be fruitful. I don't have a Bible verse for it, right? Like, just tell me you don't have a Bible verse for it. But what you're doing is you're saying, this is the thing. This is the way the apostolic works. And all the charismatic churches are like, I want to be biblical. Like, I want to be apostolic. Bethel's influential. I, why not just take their, they're, they're using apostles. This must be what apostleship is. And it's just, it's it's actually hurting the body of Christ because we're jumping steps. We're skipping steps. Um so anyway, I, I, Danny, you, you've got an open invitation. I've said it on here before a couple of times. Uh, we've sent him emails. He hasn't responded to them. So I'm not sure exactly uh, how how to further that conversation, but it's out there if, if he wants to come on. And we're going to have to continue this conversation probably at a later date. Uh, I know you guys are going to have some closing thoughts that you're going to want to get off your chest. Roundtree, do you have anything that you want to you wanna share before we, we wrap this one up? Oh, I, I would just say all the gifts in the body of Christ are extremely valuable because they're all mm -hmm. gifts that Christ purchased with his life, death, and resurrection. And part of what every gift is intended to do is to bring heaven to earth, is to demonstrate that Jesus is king. It's to bring the kingdom. Yes, it, it's ultimately to love, but what a better demonstration of what heaven is than to show love through our spiritual gifts. And so all of us have a calling in that. And apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, yes, churches should pursue all five of the fivefold. And uh, I think Danny does have a point that there is, I, I do believe, and I don't think I was clear on this earlier, I do believe that there is a prioritization. I mean, I think that's what first, second, third means in first Corinthians 12, 28. I would, I would disagree with those who would say it's merely chronological. And that was one of the interpretations right. you gave. Um, I, I, th I think that in context where he will, he's going to go on and talk about what is the most edifying for the church. And, uh, that seemed to be the one that you supported too, Josh. Uh, yeah. he, he's going to be making that argument. So I do think the, that, that, apostles and prophets have a special and unique ability to edify the church. So I don't want to, to be speaking in such a way that I'm now demonizing apostles and prophets. I, I definitely don't think I've done that, but there, there is a special place. And then, you know, with prophecy, eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. At the same time, every gift is extremely important, extremely special and in its own way brings heaven to earth. And to me, a culture of honor honors them all. And I think there is a way, there's probably a tension that we have to hold to. I think there's a way to say like, hey, let's really go after prophecy because 1 Corinthians 14 one says we're to really go after prophecy. 
but but like so on one hand we do that but on the other hand we don't do it in such a way that dishonors the other gifts and i think my biggest beef with this book is it actually does demonize certain gifts of the holy spirit and they're gifts of the spirit they're not gifts of evil spirits so i i feel like he sometimes treats it like that and the way he treats the scriptures i think this book could have really used a biblical teacher to have walked through it and helped him to find some terms. And I think it would have prevented some error that has resulted in uh, a, some devastation in the body of Christ, which grieves me. Yep. Uh, so I knew you to come to me next. Um, I, I get concerned about talking about this just because I think I can, you know, people are going to see that I have my own ax to grind and my own hurt that I've processed. But the fact is, I, I've just seen the influence of this book and I've talked to so many people. Like I can't even begin to tell you the number of people I know who were demonized because they asked questions and they were taught like tr treated like, well, you're just the teacher. So you don't get it. Right. And so my concern, I, I care like at the end of the day. And the thing that I, 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 I take a little bit personal from Danny's words here is basically that the teacher is not concerned with heavenly things and the supernatural but anybody who knows me and and everybody would say, yeah, Michael's strongest gift is teaching. But I would also say they would also say that I probably care more about seeing healing, the miraculous yeah. and deliverance from demons more than more than most people. And at my church where I was demonized for being the teacher, uh, I probably cared about it more than any of the other leaders in that ministry. Um, and was doing everything I could to promote those kind of activities of praying for the sick and praying for the demonized. Um, I, I was supremely uh, concerned with those very things and still am to this day, which is the majority of how I spend my time when I'm not at my church. I'm teaching on those very things. So it, it really yeah. is uh, bothersome to me that he would say that because it's just simply not true. Um, yeah, 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 it's good. Man, and, and and guys, I hope people who are watching this understand the uh, our response is not to correct Danny. If you're out there and you're watching and you're saying, "Man, these guys are being they're being aggressive and they're being angry," they're trying to correct Danny. No, we we don't We're even not. think Danny's Danny's not even gonna like see this video. Like I said, I've sent him three emails. I, I doubt it'll even show up on his radar. He's a busy guy. Don't think it's gonna happen. What we are clearly trying to do is mitigate the pain in charismatic spaces that say experience is more important than knowledge. We're trying to mitigate the pain that says this is this person is apostolic because he loves worship music and he's governing this massive movement of people, uh, but he can't exegete his way out of a, of a text. Um, and, and what happens is, again, m my closest friend is now a cessationist, and, and the guy that I started Remnant Radio with is... Has, has experienced tremendous abuse, I'll leave it there, uh, tremendous abuse from this kind of leadership model. Um, and both of them, their walks with God, the way that they were walking in the charismatic movement caused them so much pain that they left, right? So, so it's really, really, really important that when we look at these kinds of things, that we go, this is for the people who are experiencing pain, the sheep. I'm trying to honor them. I'm trying to honor the people who are being governed by these systems that protect abusive power structures, right? I'm trying to care for people. I, I don't I don't care if Danny never changes it. That's not, that's not important to me. What's important to me is the people who are reading these books and implementing these models in their churches that haven't thought through these things critically. These things will hurt you. Uh, please, 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 you know, Implement spiritual gifts, all of them, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, the ones in 1 Corinthians 12, the ones in Romans 12, but do it in such a way that the mission and the vision is established by Jesus and that these gifts are to edify the people. And, and let's stop making them some kind of um, idolatrous system. And again, I'm not trying to claim that Danny's doing anything. I'm saying that some kind of system where we can create a utopia if only we had these five gifts. I've been guilty of doing that, and I hope that videos like this can help save people out of making that same mistake that I've made. Um, anyway, that, that's why we're doing a video like this, is because all of this stuff is concentrated in a few pages, and we're able to read through them and go, this is why we disagree with this. So I, I hope that that makes sense to people who are watching. Um, anyway, guys, uh, tomorrow, no, tomorrow, next Wednesday, you want to pick up where we left off? Uh, part two? I think so, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, we'll 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 move through it a little bit quicker. We've got we went through three, well, two and a half really, uh, but we'll we'll finish out uh, the next three next week.
Anyway, guys, blessings. We'll see you next Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday uh, from 4 to 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, what well, man, I had a conference graphic. We have a conference in the description of this video, Healing and Deliverance <laughs> uh, Conference. We're in North Carolina. We're going to go uh, do a conference. Me, Michael, Michael, and Dawson. Uh, it's going to be a blast. You should go. You should register. Links First in the description. weekend of March. Yep, there's uh, early bird registrations. You can click on that now. You get early bird. But we also only have 200 spots. So if you don't sign up now, you don't get in. So jump in there, do that. Um, and also spooky evangelism. I want to know what you guys think about that. Leave me some comments. Oh, it's so good. Uh, the series is so good. You guys don't even know. Yeah. We, we do. We dress we up some, some of stuff. them. It's it's really <laughs> it's, it's so really good. great. It's great. Anyway, blessings, guys. Uh, we'll see you next time.